Professor Robert Enright is Professor of Educational Psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the United States, a licensed psychologist and founding board member of the International Forgiveness Institute. He is the originator of the Science of Forgiveness. He's the author of seven books on forgiveness, and Time magazine referred to him as the Forgiveness Trailblazer. It's my great honor to welcome him here because in addition to all these wonderful uh, qualities and achievements, I also consider him a new friend, Robert. Thank you, Pita, and thank you, Naftali, and thank you, Abuna. Uh, Abuna and Naftali certainly have been my teachers today. I have a feeling they were yours as well. Abuna said, we need children of prophets. We need children of prophets. How are we going to do it? How are we going to build them up? I was wondering when Naftali was sharing his story and when Abuna was sharing his story, what if Natali had been fortified with forgiveness from age four to age five to age six, and then the tragedy happened with his teenage son. Could that have fortified him? It wouldn't take the pain away. Forgiveness isn't magic. Forgiveness doesn't take the pain away. But it helps us deal with the effects of the injustice and the effects of the pain so we can go on. Forgiveness takes great strength to say, as Abuna said, you are my brother. It can take years to say that. And that's why I come to you with a sense of urgency today. You and I have about 15, 20, 25 minutes at the most for me to get the message to you that our children need to be fortified with forgiveness because I think you've seen in the last hour that very, very painful things can happen to those in the adult world. And I want to see the adults fortified in childhood so they're ready for it. May I say that I think it's a tragedy that education doesn't make room for forgiveness yet, that forgiveness is not on the radar, that forgiveness is not part of helping children in school to survive. We help children to survive by learning how to add and subtract, multiply and divide and read so they can get ready to balance a checkbook or read a newspaper or a magazine. But we don't get them ready to heal the broken heart. And that frustrates me, actually, because the pain won't be averted, but we will be able to go on well. You saw a lifetime of maturity in Abuna's words. No one except of great strength can possibly call the rest of us brothers after what he has been through. And it seems to me we're doing our children a great service if we get them ready for that. Because most of us stumble into forgiveness as adults once the bad things happen to us. And we learn forgiveness as adults when we have children to raise and 
homes to pay for and jobs to do. And sometimes we're so overwhelmed, we don't have time to bring forgiveness into our life in adulthood. One 35-year-old woman said that to me just recently. Her husband abandoned her and she didn't understand and she wasn't ready for that. And she said, I don't have time to bring forgiveness into my world. But what if she had forgiveness brought into her world little by little, from age four to five to 10 to 17 to 18, she would have been ready. And that's why I think forgiveness education needs to be in every classroom and every school in the world. All right. And at the end of the day, we're going to have the president of the New York Rotary Club, Khan, who's going to tell us about a program he and I are going to try and bring into as many war-torn areas as we can for this very reason, to give the children a chance to survive in adulthood. What if we had an antibiotic that could cure a bacterial infection and no one heard about it? What if we had a cure for unhealthy or toxic anger or even a completely, utterly broken heart and nobody heard? That's what we're facing. What might prevent the emergence of a broken heart so broken that one can't function anymore. Or a broken heart so broken that it leads to an anger that now eats away like corrosive rust inside the heart of the one who has been treated badly. That's my worry. It's with regard to those who've been treated badly and we have no fortification for them. And that's why I'm such an advocate for forgiveness education. And it took me a while to understand this. When I started studying forgiveness at the University of Wisconsin in 1985, the focus was on forgiveness therapy with adults. And we went through that yesterday. People who might have family problems, uh, job problems, lots of unjust difficulties and how to help adults heal. But it finally dawned on me in this century that we should start using forgiveness as a preventive, not just as a way to heal adults once they have the broken heart and then all the pain and then all the anger and then all the toxic anger and everything that goes with that as Bishop Shomali told us yesterday, such as a compromised immune system or perhaps a health problem or perhaps relationship problems or perhaps a depression or emotional compromise that can bring us down perhaps even more so than the physical issues. Forgiveness education may be an answer to that. Just to review from yesterday, just some of you weren't here yesterday, the definition of forgiveness is that we first have been treated unjustly, we strive to get rid of something negative, in this case resentment toward the other, so they can become my brother, as Abuna says, and then we strive to offer goodness to the person of some kind. And I hope you're beginning to see in these two days why I say forgiveness is so heroic. Right? You're being good to those who are displacing you from your home. You are being good to those who have murdered your son. Right? You're being good, as the 35-year-old woman said to me recently, as best she can, to her husband who abandoned her. It's probably the most heroic virtue on the planet. Because it's very easy to be kind to those who are kind to you. Forgiveness is not, as we said yesterday, condoning and saying, oh, it's okay. It's never okay to be displaced from your home or to experience the murder of a child. It was wrong, is wrong, and will always be wrong. Forgiveness acknowledges that. You don't forget, many of the panelists yesterday said that. It's not simply calming down or being indifferent, and it may or may not include reconciliation. And I think that was the message that Dr. Al-Habash was saying. I love to clarify with him. He said, no forgiveness without justice. 
Maybe he was saying no reconciliation without justice, but I don't want to put words in his mouth. And as Abuna had said, you do not abandon the quest for, just, for fairness or justice when you forgive. Yes, it is complex, as you say, Abuna, but the two can grow up side by side, and children need to know that, you see. Because some might say, well, if I forgive, I'm just letting others have their way. But with good forgiveness education, children will know that, and therefore adults will know that. Just five points from yesterday about how people forgive. And by the way, with forgiveness education, we really don't go through these because children aren't developmentally ready so much for this. They're more ready for what forgiveness is and to get a sense of it through story and through discussion. And they don't really necessarily go through all of this. But you do recognize you've been treated unfairly. You commit to do no harm to the other. I do not want to do harm to my brother. I commit to do no harm. That's Abuna's message to me. Thank you for being my teacher, Abuna. We try to see the inherent worth of all. That was, again, one of Abuna's points here. We try to see the worth in all. His words were, we're all made in the image and likeness of God. And that takes time. That takes a lot of time to learn. And that's why we might want to start with four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds to get it in the head and in the heart. Okay? When we forgive, we bear the pain so we don't react. That was a theme yesterday with Rabbi Sachs. It was a theme today with Abuna. And then we try as best we can to grow in the heroism of being good with an emphasis on the word to grow. And to grow means giving the children time, which means getting them to learn about forgiveness in the quiet of a classroom before the storms of adulthood hit them. Why am I frozen here? <laughs> I'm frozen, everybody. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. So what is forgiveness education? Well, forgiveness education helps students, as you will see in the coming talks today, to see how, for example, story characters might solve problems, especially in elementary school. It helps students understand. See, it's not so much practicing the tough things of forgiveness, but to understand what kindness is, what respect is, what love is, and what these are when treated unjustly. And forgiveness education helps students in the safety of their classroom, in the safety of home, to begin thinking about and practicing forgiveness a little bit before those storms of life come. Forgiveness education introduces students through story. That's one of my messages to you today. It's oftentimes in the younger ages through story so that they see story characters forgiving. They, they get a sense of what that is. And it actually, in seeing the stories, hearing characters go through difficulties, it actually can reduce the children's anger as they see story characters engaging in forgiveness. It can increase cooperation in the classroom, and we've seen academic achievement go up when they learn to forgive. Why? If you have a broken heart, you're not going to listen much to what the teacher says. With that broken heart quieted, you can focus better and cooperate better. And a lot of times, forgiveness education folds into existing curricula. And you'll hear more about that from Catherine and Andrew and others very shortly. But it can occur about an hour a week, and it can last for 12 to 17 weeks. It's not for the whole year necessarily, and you fold it in where it works best. And here are some of our scientific studies on forgiveness education, just to show you that indeed it works. We worked with first and fifth grade students in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. People from different racial groups do not interact much. 
and there's a lot of pain in that city. And we engage in forgiveness education, not I, but regular classroom teachers like Andrew Frizzell, who you will meet in a minute. And after learning about forgiveness through stories, the children's own level of anger decreased. And what's interesting about that is in both Belfast, Northern Ireland, and in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the children come to us as young as age six, already too angry. They're around what we call the clinical level of anger at age six. They've hardly been in the world and their hearts are already in pain because we've done studies on anger. And if a clinical psychologist looks at the average child in these communities as young as age six, the clinical psychologist is going to be worried about the average child. And it makes sense because they're challenging environments. As young as third grade, or primary five, in um, Belfast, they can also in decrease in psychological depression because some come to us depressed already. We've done middle school, which is adolescence, and you'll hear from people who work with adolescents, and they improve in emotional health and academic achievement. We have the same kind of situation in South Korea. Here's an example, okay, of our curriculum guides. We give teachers these guides that come in a variety of ways. We have anti-bullying, we have an end-of-life guide that we talked about yesterday. That's not for children, but for adults, and we even have some for family. And here's just an example. Horton Hears a Who is an American picture book by Dr. Seuss and he saves a whole world of the who's. Because, and he keeps saying, and a person is a person no matter how small. That's not unlike what a Buddha just said when he said we're all made in the image and likeness of God. He says we're all children of God. Well, Horton, the elephant, the kind elephant tells us, a person is a person no matter how small, or rich or poor, or what side of the country you come from, or whether you're Palestinian, or whether you're Israeli, or whether you're African American, or Caucasian in America. A person is a person no matter how small. You know what that gives them the sense of? Inherent worth. The worth of all. And that starts as young as age six right here. And this book can cost as much as 15 United States dollars. We work in Liberia, Africa, where the average adult wage is about 200 United States dollars. They can't afford this book. So we've had all of the books summarized by a retired journalist, and all of these summaries can be used instead of the book, so you can equip a classroom literally for nothing, no cost, all right? And then here's uh, an example. Let me see, go back here a little bit. Okay, here's an example of the first lesson in first grade or primary three in Belfast. It's called a person is a person. And what we're getting at is the idea of inherent worth or built-in worth apart from forgiveness. You see, we first introduce the concepts such as kindness, respect, generosity, and love apart from forgiveness, apart from being hurt. And it's the same thing with inherent or built-in worth. The first lesson with the main idea, as you can see, that's for the teacher. How long is that going to take the teacher to read? In blue there. Five minutes? They're going to get the idea that they want to instill in the student the, the idea that all persons are valuable because they are persons. And it's filtered through Horton Hears a Who, where he said a person is a person no matter how small. And then we have behavioral objectives where we tell the teachers what we're going to do. We're going to read the story, Dr. Seuss, Horton Hears a Who, participate in class discussions. We tell the teacher what kind of materials we have, and then we go through the procedure. And then we have discussion questions. What happened in the story? Throughout the story, Horton kept saying, a person is a person no matter how small. What do you think he meant? Do you see how we're playing this for when someone loses their son from an attack? 
But we're not going that deeply. We're not going that profoundly. Do you realize we're playing this where someone is displaced from their home and never gets the home back? Where the person, and you saw it live and in front of you, Abuna telling you that those who dis displaced him from his home are persons no matter how small or great or large or rich or poor. He said that without using those exact words. We're getting first grade children, six year olds, ready for that kind of mature thinking. And I don't think most will come to that thinking without the education. You see, we are preparing children for their broken hearts because this is a difficult world. And you heard that from Naftali and Abuna. A person is a person, no matter how small, might almost seem unimportant for a first grader or a six-year-old, but it's getting them ready for the big hurts of their life later on. We're beginning to strengthen their heart and mind. And then there's an activity where they put on the blackboard. A person is a person no matter what else. How rich you are, how good you are in football, how popular you are. Even if someone hurts you, ah, even if someone hurts you, are they a person? You see, we're playing it eventually for the broken heart. We're strengthening them for the broken heart. And there are a lot of people beginning to join us. Forgiveness education is now in all of these lands. Aha, there's the Philippines. We're going to hear from the Philippines today. There's Northern Ireland, they're up next. Okay. Israel, we have Galilee today, and the United States is represented, and forgiveness education curricula, like I just showed you, are in all of these places. I hope it's in more. I talked to someone from Spain yesterday. I talked with someone from Russia. I don't see them on here yet. Okay, let's put them on. Eight reasons why we need forgiveness education. First, to help a student become emotionally healthier. That's the psychological issue. To help the student repair relationships. That's the interpersonal issue. To help a student grow in character. That's the strengthening issue. To help the student be of assistance within reason toward the one who acted unfairly to help. That's the altruistic issue. To help the students when they are adults to do what? Help their children see the beauty of forgiveness so that their own children are protected. That's the next generation issue. And to help the student even in a little way to create a better world. To help the student honor his or her own faith. And to exercise forgiveness as an end in and of itself. Forgiveness simply is good, no matter what the outcome. Forgiveness is good if the other spits in your face over it. Forgiveness is good even if you don't get reconciliation or get your son back or get your home back. Forgiveness is good in and of itself, and that takes time to learn. And that's why we need forgiveness education for all of these reasons. I'm worried about the children of the future because I know their hearts will be broken and you know that as well as I. Forgiveness can be a protection of their broken heart. Abuna showed us that. Naftali told us that. And I think they speak much more loudly and better for forgiveness education than I. So I'd like to end here, and now let's take a look at some concrete manifestations of forgiveness with those who are heroically in the trenches teaching them.